I'm going to preach on just one verse today, Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a tremendous verse of scripture this is. And in some ways, this scripture is one of the most uplifting and encouraging and wonderful and amazing verses in all of the Bible. In some other respects, it's one of the more intimidating or um, troubling almost verses in the Bible for me. It's exciting and, and thrilling because it's the highest reality there is. Christ lives in me, but for that very reason, it's also one of the more troubling verses, at least for me. Maybe you're never troubled by this one. This, this is the kind of verse which is a tremendous comfort and an invitation at the very beginning of your Christian life and kind of a beacon all through your Christian life. And yet, there's also... Um, at least for me, this question, now if Christ lives in me, why am I so often still such a muddled mess? If Christ lives in me, shouldn't I always have complete clarity and certainty in my understanding of things and in my confidence in the truths of the things of God? If Christ lives in me, what does it mean to actually hear from him, to be guided by him, to receive communication from him? If Christ lives in me, why isn't there more evidence of it in my character? Why isn't there more um, power released in my life? Now, those are not even questions you need to be troubled with if you don't focus on this reality that Christ lives in me. If your version of Christianity is only um, that very last part, he loved me and gave himself for me and rescued me from the penalty of sin and I get to go to heaven someday, that's in itself wonderful truth and it doesn't leave you with some of those other questions. You just say, well, Christ died to take away my sins and I'm going to heaven now, I'm back to living my life. If the reality of Jesus living in you and sometimes the dimness of that reality um, and just what does it mean in day-to-day -day life? I mean, that's part of the puzzle. One of the challenges as a preacher is what in the world do I say about it? Because if Christ in his reality isn't already conveying all that within you, most of my words are going to be a waste of time. We sometimes read the Apostle Paul and we find him hard to understand because he's such a deep thinker who uses such deep words at times. But there's another reason why the Apostle Paul can be very hard to understand. Because I think the level of his experience is not a level that we have been at very much and things that were just um, immediate realities to him don't seem quite so real to us. It's always hard to describe something that another person has never experienced. I could try to describe to you an orange, but I can't even begin to describe the color of an orange if you're a person who is sightless and has never seen any colors. How do I describe orange to a blind person? How do I describe the taste of an orange if Let's say um, broccoli is the only thing you've ever tasted or, or oatmeal. I, I just don't have anything in your experience to compare it to. And if you've tasted one, there's really no point in talking about it. Um, you either know the taste or you don't. So that's one of the things that makes um, living in this reality and speaking about it sometimes a challenge. The encouraging thing is, of course, that um, Christ himself will have to be speaking from me and Christ himself will need to be doing some of the work to give you ears to hear and to experience some of these realities of him living in you for yourself. Now, I don't want to get too caught up in some of the um, difficulties or challenges just yet. I first want to just think about the, uh, the amazing uh, fact that Christ comes to live in me and in you. 
And what a stupendous difference that can make. Some of you know that Charles Colson died yesterday. Charles Colson was 80 years old. Many of you don't know who Charles Colson is, perhaps because you're kind of young or you don't follow what goes on in the evangelical world lately either. Back in the 1970s, an awful lot of people knew who Charles Colson was. He was President Nixon's hatchet man. Um, he was the one who helped compile the enemies list that Nixon was going to use the power of government to bring down those who were his political opponents. Um, he was very devoted to politics. He once said he would walk on his grandmother's grave to get Nixon reelected. That kind of got translated in the media as he would run over his own grandmother to get Nixon reelected. But we'll, we'll just say it this way. He was a very tough character. Um, one magazine writer called him Richard Nixon's hard man, the evil genius of an evil administration. And Colson himself said, I was valuable to the president because I was willing to be ruthless in getting things done. Well, one of the things he was doing to help get things done was cover up the Watergate break-in and also um, to bring down a man named Daniel Ellsberg who had revealed some things that were damaging to the president. And Colson was caught. And so he was... Um, under, in the process of being sentenced to prison when he was converted to Christ. And his conversion was greeted with great skepticism. One uh, journalist said, I cannot accept the sudden coming to Christ of Charles Colson if he isn't embarrassed by this sudden excess of piety, then surely the Lord must be. Someone else said, if Mr. Colson can repent of his sins, there just has to be hope for everybody. Well, yeah. And Charles Colson went on to um, found a ministry called Prison Fellowship, the largest prison ministry in the world, to do a lot of things to reach out to the people who were the lost and the last and the least in society. He founded a Worldview Institute and um, wrote or co-authored many books and did a lot in the work of the Lord. Now, in his conversion, there are some interesting things that happened. One is that um, uh, one of the most instrumental people in helping lead him to the Lord was a man um, named Hughes. And Senator Hughes was a very liberal Democrat. And Colson was a hatchet man for the Republicans. And it was this liberal Democrat who was devoted to Jesus and helped lead Colson to the Lord. There was another government official after Colson went to prison who made an amazing offer. Colson was in prison and his 15-year-old son got in trouble with the law um, for trying to sell some marijuana and was just very troubled while his father was away. And um, the former governor of Minnesota discovered an obscure law which allowed an innocent person to serve prison time for somebody else. And he offered to go to prison so that Colson could get out and go back home to his son. Um, his offer was, um, was not received because Colson was released you know, on good behavior and other things like that before they could take him up on it. But those were some of the things that were going on. Someone who was a total political enemy of his was his brother in Christ. Somebody else was willing to go to prison for him. And after Colson got out of prison, he really never quite got out. He kept going back um, to minister to other people. Now, one of the books that was most instrumental in his conversion was C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. Um, Hughes and others had shared that book with him and, and Colson read it. I'll give you just a few excerpts from mere, near the end of Mere Christianity that you know, are quite striking. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ to make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. The purpose of the church the purpose of Jesus becoming man, the purpose of the creation of the universe was so that 
Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith and that many, many, many little Christs would grow and develop and show forth the life of Christ. The more we get what we call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. I've been crucified with Christ and, and then later on, the life I live. So there's a, something in us dies, but then something else comes to life and it's not just some alien thing, it's actually the true me who I was meant to be. The more truly ourselves we become. There is so much of Christ that millions and millions of little Christs, all different, will still be too few to express him fully. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. The hatchet man is really just a thing, driven by urges and ambitions and not by real personality. Many folks live their lives just driven by their environment or the world around them or driven by their own urges or desires which um, are often in conflict with who they really are and could be. And Christ brings out the true self. To be a Christian then is not just to hold correct opinions based on the Bible. It's not just to get off the hook for our sins or to have a ticket for heaven. It is important to have good opinions based on the Bible. It's very important to be forgiven of our sins and to go to heaven. But before we go to heaven, heaven comes to us. Before we live with Christ face to face, Christ comes to live in us. And so to be a Christian is to have Christ living inside of me. I don't just have eternal life. I have the life of the eternal. And that's what makes it eternal life. I have the life of the divine one in me. And that's why it can't die. And that's why it can't be taken away. Jesus himself spoke of this. The glory, he's speaking to his Father in heaven, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me. I have made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, there's, this verse alone is worthy of many sermons and much meditation, but let me just highlight something. The fact that Jesus lives in us means that the beloved of the Father is in us. Think of it this way. Um, you've got a magnet. And a magnet has kind of a, a power all its own. And a magnet draws things towards it. And when Jesus comes and lives in your heart, you in a sense have a love magnet. You have the one who is beloved of the Father from before the foundation of the world and he's inside you, and that is just a huge magnet drawing towards him all the love of the maker of the universe. And so Jesus says, the love with which you have loved me will be in them, and I will be in them. And this is what Jesus prayed for, and what he still prays for in heaven. In heaven, in the presence of the Father, he is sending his spirit and working in us to draw our hearts and our love towards the Father. And through his spirit living in our hearts, he is drawing the Father's love to us. And so the beloved living in us makes us, in a sense, love magnets, um, to be loved by God with the very love that he has for Jesus. Christ lives in me. What a, what a tremendous statement. And it's not an isolated statement that appears, that has no other reflections in the Bible. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For me to live is Christ. Paul prays for his readers that we'll be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And so Christ living in me, Christ dwelling in the heart is the beginning of Christianity in some ways, but also the ultimate goal of Christianity, which in a sense, it, it takes your whole life to even begin to grasp more and more of this. As I said, this is what it is to belong to Jesus. And, and at the same time, who of us is so mature that says, you know what, I have um, just such a high level of, of Christ in me that I know all the time when I'm hearing his voice and I'm just 
I just have a direct pipeline at all times. I'm so filled with him that my character resembles him perfectly. Uh, you know, these, when you think of Christ lives in me, if you've ever had any trouble with humility, then you need to meditate on these four verses. In one sense, these are enough to lift up the lowliest person in the world and set us on a throne. But on another, at another level, these are words that are enough to just humble us to the dust because I say, Christ lives in me, then, wow, I have got a lot to learn. I have got a lot to discover because very often um, this seems to be very small to me, hardly noticeable to me. And I don't even begin to know what it means to, to hear his voice or to experience his power from day to day. So, um, you know, it, sometimes when you get into the religion business or when you get into Christian life and church life, there are many things that you, after a while, make some progress in, noticeable progress, and you can get kind of um, pleased about that. You know, you've read your Bible a few times, and now you know it a little better than a lot of other people do. Or you've thought about how Christianity applies to certain aspects of life, and so um, you've got that figured out. Or you go to church, or you read... You pray more often than other people do. These are all things maybe that you can start to take some pride in. Just go in a room by yourself and think about Christ lives in me. This was one of the hardest sermons for me to get ready for just because I was going to preach on those four words. And I thought, man, I, you know, I know so little. Um, how am I supposed to convey very much? And yet this is... This is the thing that always gets us back on track again. Remember now, you've been reading in Galatians this week, many of you. Remember when Paul says this. He says this in the middle of a showdown where some people are saying, we're not going to eat with you because we're better than you. And then there are others who say, well, I don't really think I'm better than them, but I do want to fit in with those hot shots. And so I'm going to separate myself from those other people so I can hang out with the more holy, the, the people who really have all the rituals. And Paul gets up, and Peter is involved in this. The apostle Peter and Barnabas, you know, the biggest of the bigs are falling into this. And Paul says, well, I saw they weren't acting in line with the gospel, so I got up in front of them all. And I just told Peter right off to his face. And at the end of his speech, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. All that stuff doesn't matter anymore. Christ lives in me. And if Christ lives in me, and if Christ lives in those Gentile Christians, am I going to separate myself from Christ? Do I have the right to say, I'm better than you. I, I know you got Jesus living in you, but who cares about that? You know, <laughs> the moment you say it that way, it immediately collapses. When you have Christ in you, then what is Christ's attitude towards someone else who has Christ as well? Well, you can't separate anymore. And so um, this has enormous um, practical power when people are in the middle of a pinch. Here's another statement from Jesus himself in the book of Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now, Jesus writes this to a church that is so lukewarm. He says, I'm kind of of a mind to spit you out. But I stand at the door and knock, and I would love to have fellowship with you. I'll come in and eat with you. So once again, there's this wonderful invitation and promise, and it comes in the middle of a very difficult uh, and messy situation. If you want to understand and, and be humbled and brought back into right relationship with God, then Christ lives in me is just the beacon that always brings you back again. When you're tempted like Peter and Barnabas to get off track and get caught up in other stuff, Christ lives in me. Um, Christ died for me. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. It's new covenant living. We've been reading the book of Jeremiah, and that's a long book, and it is a drag to keep on reading it. Now you may say, boy, a preacher should never say that about part of God's word. But it is a drag to be reading chapter after chapter, but I'm going to blast you. You're going to be ruined. you got big problems. You're going down. It, that, you know, for after about 55 chapters of that, that's a lot. 
But don't forget what Jeremiah said. I've got a new covenant in mind. And this is what it's like to live under this old covenant. You want to live under that law, you don't measure up. You need a new covenant where I'm going to live in, my, in your heart and put my thoughts and my laws on your heart. And that's what you need. And that's exactly, by the way, why Peter had to get up, had to be rebuked by Paul because they were trying to bring people back under the old covenant and get them away from Jesus Christ living in them. And when Jesus is talking to lukewarm people, same thing. Um, I'm knocking, I'll come in. Very often, friends, when there's something amiss in your own life, don't just look for this symptom or that little thing that needs to be fixed. Get back to the heart of things. Where's your heart? Who's in your heart? When you're dealing with somebody else, too, you may have this or that criticism, but the most important thing is, is Christ living in them or not? If he's not, then there are bigger fish to fry than whatever your particular problem with them might be. And you can't just straighten them out by straightening them out. <laughs> Colson did not become who he was uh, by having somebody give him a little lecture on not being a bad guy and a hatchet man. He, he changed because Christ came into his heart. And as the first book he wrote after his conversion was titled, Born Again. <laughs> That's what the Bible calls it when Christ comes in and lives and gives new life. So, just to backtrack in the big picture of the Bible... Again, we, we have union with Christ, and part of it, and a great part of the gospel, is a legal union. Jesus represents us and does stuff for us that we can't do for ourselves. He's our legal head. He acts on our behalf, and what he does is counted by God as ours. And this is a tremendous truth of the gospel. As it says in the verse right after this, if we could be saved by the works of the law, then Christ died for nothing. We needed Christ as our legal head and to take our penalty and our punishment. And so our legal union with Jesus, just what he does on our behalf, is very important. Uh, uh, you know how that works. If the President of the United States decides to get into a war, we're all in a war. If the President and the Congress decide that they're going to run a trillion dollar deficit, we're all getting deeper and deeper in debt because our legal head is doing certain things on our behalf that affect us very much. Jesus, as the legal head of those who trust him, does things that involve us all. But that's not all. Jesus lives in us and we live in him through a living connection. So there's this living union with Christ where he's the head, we're the body, or he's someone living in our hearts. The Bible has different ways of talking about this. But his actions are affecting and directing our experience. It's not just what he's doing for us, but what he's doing in us as his presence overflows into our lives. And here's a very important thing to consider. If you don't have a living union with Christ, if Jesus is not living in you, then don't assume you have a legal union with him. There are some people who think that if they've received forgiveness and they're going to go to heaven, um, then that's what faith is. If you do not have the life of Christ in you, then the legal union isn't there either. Okay. Now this doesn't mean that our salvation is based on what's going on inside us. It's based on what Jesus did outside us. But those who have that credited to them are also those who have Jesus living inside them. And that's why the Bible says, now you need, to, you need to test and ask yourself this question, is Christ Jesus in you? Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. So this is a, a very profound test. It's not just, now what notions do I hold in my mind? It is, who lives in me? And there are times when it can be, um, we can fool ourselves either for worse or for better. There are Christians who struggle with, is Christ really living in me? And they're often downcast when... They really wouldn't have to be. There are others 
who may think that all's well, but they really don't know any objective tests. Now, the book of 1 John gives three objective tests. One is, what do you believe? If you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you don't believe that he came in the flesh to take away the sins of the world, then you can be pretty sure that he's not living in you. That's what the Apostle John says. He says, if you don't love, he's not in you because everyone who loves has been born of God because God is love. If you don't obey God's commands and you're not interested in obeying God's commands, you're just fooling yourself if you think you're a Christian. You say, well, I believe in God and I don't believe in salvation by works and so I don't need to do anything. Well, if your life isn't being changed, then it's strong evidence that there is no Christ living in you in the first place. So it is important to test ourselves at, in objective fashion. Is there an acceptance of truth, a growth in love, a growth in obedience? Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. That's what the Bible says. So um, we do need to ask this question, is Christ in you? And and 1 John also speaks of it this way. This is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Jesus, after ascending to the Father, had promised the disciples that he had been with them and would be in them. And then he sent his spirit to be in us, a life and a power and a personality, his own, in us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And a couple texts from Galatians that we'll be reading this week. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. And the apostle says, I'm in the pains of childbirth till Christ is formed in you. And so we all... This is something that I keep returning to again and again and again in my own life, and I need to. In, in one sense, maybe I should preach the same sermon just about every week until it sinks in because there is no other, there's almost nothing else to be said but this. Everything else is footnotes. That Christ lives in me, or Christ in you. And as I've highlighted before, I'll, I'll just highlight again some of the implications of this. One is that his suffering is our suffering. Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, when you talk about being crucified with Christ, one thing that means is all the stuff I used to count on, I just can't count on anymore to make me right with God. And I can't count on it either to change my life and to make me a better person. He goes in Galatians, he says, you crazy Galatians, who bewitched you? I showed you Jesus Christ crucified, and you started out with his spirit, and his spirit... Um, made changes in you and even performed miracles among you. Now you started with that spirit. Do you want to go back? You want to go back to before Christ was living in you and count on other stuff besides Christ living in you? And he, he wants them to make everything um, counted as rubbish to gain Christ. And he'd rather suffer with Christ than prosper in any other condition. He'll share in his sufferings, become like him in his death, in order to attain the resurrection of the dead. He wants to know Christ. And Paul uses that language a lot. You know, we, we need to be glorified with him, but first we suffer with him. And so he suffered for us, but he also suffers in us and through us. Part of that is giving up on certain things. Part of it is just the hits that come our way living the Christian life. His mission is my mission. And that's a tremendous encouragement as well. Paul says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Now, for each of us, you know, I've talked about this before, I just want to emphasize it again. Christ gives each of us a commission or a co-mission, a stewardship, a domain, where Christ is living in you and he's acting through you and your actions are actually his actions and he's reigning, but he's reigning through the responsibilities that he gives to you. So you need to view, um, those of you who are parents, your family as part of a domain that Christ has given you responsibility for. And the main purpose of good parenting, as we put it, um, is to let Christ's life 
shine from you and flow from you. You can read 87 books on parenting and none of them will have the same value as simply Christ living in you and the, and the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You put that list not on my to-do list, but as fruit that comes out of you because Christ is living in you. And your life will be one that brings blessing and encouragement and vitality to people around you. If you try to do it in the power of the flesh and get your long lists of what your kids need to do and what you need to do to measure up and all that, now I'm not saying you should never have guidance, but to simply have Christ doing it through you and just viewing it as Christ's job will let a lot of the pressure off of you and quite a bit of the pressure off those who are in your domain. When you go to work, you're not going there alone. Christ is going there in you. And your job every morning is to wake up and not just haul out the list right away of stuff you gotta do for the day, but to spend some time really just paying attention to Jesus Christ. Say, okay, Lord, this is my day, I think. You might have some other things in mind before the day is over, but I, I think this is what my day might turn out like, Lord willing. Uh, but I want you to walk with me through it and be present in me. And when I run into a tough spot, help my mind to go to you and let my mind be yours. And so you have this domain, whether it's in your work, whether it's in your family, um, when you boys and girls are, are playing with your friends or with your brother or sister. You can just measure, okay, am I getting the toy I wanted or am I not? Are they doing what I want or what they want? And if it's not what I want, we're going to have an argument about it. Okay? And then you want somebody to intervene maybe on your side because, of course, they always started it. And you're always in the right. We all know this. This is a law of reality that I'm right. This is what the Bible calls the flesh. I'm always right. Um, and... You can start at a very early age saying, okay, now, I'm not that old, but Jesus lives in me. And is this behavior now what Jesus is leading me into? Or is it my old fallen self that is making me want to do that? And so you're never too old, never too young to always be realizing that you have a mission. And it's the mission of Jesus living in you. And you come more and more alive when you, when you see your work in that light, when you see your play in that light, when you see your family life in that light. It is deadly. It is Phariseeism to just have lists that you're striving for. His mind is my mind. We have the mind of Christ. Now again, it, these statements... As I've said before, these statements and others like them are the kind that are just so fantastic that if you read them in certain moods, you say, what a fantastic thing it is to be a Christian. What a privilege. Man, I am ready for this day and it is going to be great because Christ lives in me and I have the mind of Christ. And then there are days where you say, if that's what it means to be a Christian, how in the world can I call myself one? My mind you know, the thoughts I think and the attitudes I have are just so far separate from that. And it's okay, I think, to have both of those. You know, we don't want to um, get, you know, just wildly all over the map and torn to pieces maybe. But, but there are times when we do need that to be just lifted up to the heavens. And there are other times we do need to be brought very low and say, wow, I have a law at the very least even if I am a Christian, have a very, 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 very long way to go. And my sense of God's mind in me and Christ's mind in me is very, very dim. The reason I want to preach these things again and again and again is so that you will seek them. There is a very great danger of whittling what it means to be a Christian down to a little easy package and then saying, well, that is doable. That's good enough. What you want is to have a holy dissatisfaction your whole life, a yearning desire to know him more 
and to have him take over more and more of your mind and of your life. But don't forget the glory part of it. Um, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. It's a mystery. It's glorious. And it is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Gentiles and not just Jews are gloriously rich. That's again one of the main points of Galatians. This passage, Christ lives in me, is spoken where Jews were separating themselves from Gentiles. And so both are gloriously rich in Christ. And it's Christ in us, not just Christ with us. It's God reigning through us, not just over us. And Christ's co-reign, you know, I talked about that domain, is just a first taste of the glory of being on thrones with him forever. Jesus said, whoever overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. Just a little bit of that already starts in this life. When you're carrying on that mission, that purpose that he's given you. And if you don't know what that is yet, and it's not always just one thing, but be praying, what is your purpose? What is the glory that you have for me? The way in which my life is going to display the glory of Jesus. And be praying about that so that you can co-reign with him and then uh, one who is faithful in a few things will be put in charge of many things, as our Lord Jesus says. The man who's faithful with a bit of money may someday be a ruler of ten cities because um, Christ reigning through him, he's proven faithful. Christ is so richly glorious that he can't fully be expressed in any one of us. That's what C.S. Lewis was saying. Millions of believers display different facets of Jesus' glory and reign. So, we don't all have to be carbon copies. Jesus is too much for any one of us to fully express him. The same Christ lives in all of us. He reigns in all of us by the very same spirit. And yet he displays himself in really, really different personalities. And it's not just different personalities, but you have a heart for different stuff. Charles Colson had a heart for people in prison. You can understand that given some of the experience that God had put him through. But God gave him a heart for... He didn't say, Phew, I'm glad that stinking prison sentence is over. Now, I have political gifts. I'm back into politics. God could have called him back into politics, but he didn't. Um, I remember, uh, you know, I was talking to Debbie the other day, uh, Debbie Heard, and she says, well, I don't know why God gave me a heart for India. He just did. You know, why India? You know, there's a couple hundred countries in the world. Why that one? You don't know, but that's the way it is. Um, you know, God gives me a heart to do certain things, and others have a very different calling. But it is important to understand that Christ in your heart will lay things on your heart. And once that's laid on your heart, don't ignore. Don't ignore what Jesus is prompting you to do, because that is the way you die inside, and that is the way you quench the Spirit. When you sense more and more clearly what Jesus is up to, the kinds of things he made you good at, the kinds of stuff he wants you to be involved in, then go for it. And don't necessarily feel guilty when you look at somebody else who's involved in different stuff, excellent things. We can't all do everything. Jesus is omnipotent. You're not. Um, Jesus can be present everywhere by his spirit. We can't. And so he gives each of us different domains, different desires, but they can all be of him. My life, his life is my life. Again, what Lewis was saying earlier. Why do preachers and churches exist? To proclaim Christ and to form Christ in people. Again, Galatians, till Christ is formed in you. The goal is mature manhood, the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. We want to present to everybody mature in Christ. Again, there's great danger in this kind of a message because now it's, it's the Paul danger. You think that I'm just talking about high theology. This is what it is to be a Christian. This is ordinary, normal Christianity. And we need to understand that to become more and more like Jesus is what it's all about. I mean, learning Bible verses, you know, all the stuff we do, it's either going to help us become more like Christ or it's not. But if it's not, it's really not doing us any good. You don't do it for its own sake. We need to connect with each other in Christ. That's what was so dangerous in Galatia. When some people wouldn't eat with others, they were missing out on the presence of Christ in others. In heart-to-heart -heart connections with others, you display the unique glory of Christ that's in you, 
and you delight in the unique glories of Christ that are in others. And the reason we connect, the reason we get together, the reason we spend time together is to share what Christ is doing in us and to battle together against the hindrances of Christ that are within us and to strengthen each other. So when I see something that is contrary to Christ in you, I owe it to you to say so. But when I see something that is of Christ in you, I owe it to you to say so. Because sometimes it's easy to get discouraged and wonder whether Christ is in us. And it helps to hear somebody else say, I really see Jesus at work through you and what you're doing here. And so we strengthen each other in that way. And as Christ in you connects with Christ in me, then, then I can grow in Jesus' power and insight and love. That, that's one danger, by the way, of saying Christ lives in me, is turning it into kind of Christ lives only in me. And I can have the fullness of Christ with just me and Jesus only. No, it is very personal and individual and yet involves connecting with others. And then this one, the strength of Jesus. Just a few of the texts about that. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I'm going to talk more next week about um, battling the sin nature and battling the, the works of the devil. And you can't do it with a list of instructions. When Satan comes, you need to send Jesus to the door because you're not going to do real well um, fighting off his temptations on your own. And so we need to remember he's greater. And when we're working on his behalf, it's his energy that's working within us. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the, the strength of Jesus is the reality that we need to seek more and more. And where we sense that it's lacking, it can go two ways. One is that sometimes we learn that the weaker we get, the stronger he gets in us. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. So it doesn't always mean that if Christ lives in you, that therefore when you flex, the muscles pop and everybody says, ooh, ah, you know, what a, what a man of power in the Lord. You know, oftentimes Jesus himself was looked down on. Um, Paul was despised as kind of a lousy speaker, the greatest missionary in the history of the world, and people didn't think he could preach worth a hoot, at least some of them. So you, you got to understand that that having the power of Christ is not always the same as being recognized and, and feeling fabulous at all times. But by the same token, we do need to face the fact that it's his strength that's going to get us by or we're not going to make it. And Christ lives in me is where our authority comes from, where our strength comes from. Well, let me just end by those words of Jesus again. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus wants to be in your life, literally, in your heart. He wants to be fellowshipping with you. He wants you to be living in him and he in you. And you might not have the dramatic story of being a famous hatchet man who goes on to found some famous ministries, for some of you, it may turn out that you do get to be kind of famous after a while. I don't know what the Lord has in store for you. But I do know this, that when Christ is in you, that will be the key to just everything. This is the highest thing in the world. This is the thing to seek your whole life and don't settle for anything less. Father, we do thank you for Jesus and for these realities that you have made come about by your spirit and by Christ living in us. Lord, I pray that, that you will go far beyond these words, that you'll go far beyond anything that I can honestly say um, is true even of my own life, and that you will do within us far more than all we dare to ask or imagine according to your power that's already at work within us. Lord, we pray that you will not help us fall prey to um, the error of trying to make ourselves right with you, or trying to live our lives in the power of our own flesh, but instead to have Christ be our all. Lord, bless each one of us, help us to flourish with the life of Christ. In his name, amen.